Paisley, Lyle Lovett, Emmy Lou Harris, Billy Gibbons, Vince Gill, and Arlen Roth are just a small handful of artists. George Groon has sold guitars too. At almost every show I go to in Nashville, I see someone from the band with a Groon guitar case or sticker or other kind of merchandise. If you aren't deep into the music scene, you might not immediately recognize George Groon's name. Or if you're just visiting Nashville and happen to drive or walk past his store, you might think it's just another guitar shop. But anyone who's anyone knows that George Groon and Groon Guitars is a legendary business that operates in Nashville but is known worldwide. Located just outside of downtown Nashville's historic Broadway Street, it's a sight you cannot miss from your driver or passenger window. It's the one and only famous Groon Guitars. This three-story building is the largest location they've operated in to date. The first floor is the showroom, open to the public Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6 p.m. The second floor is a higher-end showroom with finer collectibles. The second floor is also home to several staff members' offices, including George's office, a massive amount of storage space, and even a tryout room. And the third floor is a dedicated space to repairs and builds. And the man behind it all? 77-year-old George Groon. Not only is George notorious for his collections and sales and knowledge in the vintage instrument industry, but he is also the author of several books on the subject. Surprisingly, George approaches the study of vintage instruments in the same manner that he approached his zoological degree back in his college days. George's snake collection means just as much to him as his instruments. Over the years, George has done countless interviews and released numerous newsletters detailing his early career memories and current state of affairs. But there's so much more to George and his life. In this Roots Rockumentary, we're going to deep dive into the real roots behind George Groon and everything that made George Groon the man, the myth, and the legend of Groon guitars that you see today. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. It's totally free, and you'll be notified every time I post a new Roots Rockumentary. Like George Groon was born in Brooklyn, New York, in a tiny apartment to his mother and father while his father was studying pathology at New York's medical school. However, soon after George was born, his father was drafted to Okinawa, Japan, to serve in the war as a medic. And uh, well, he was a medical student, and they, they drafted the medical students, but they still put them through an accelerated program. Many of the young brides at this time who had young children moved back in with their parents. But for George's mother, she was fiercely independent. My mom didn't want to have anything to do with having to move back with mommy and daddy. She was determined to make it on her own and to give George the most independent life that he could have. But that also meant sacrifices. Obviously, her husband had just gone through medical school. Finances were a little bit tight. George's mother was able to find a small apartment for her and George, but it was called what was commonly referred to as a cold water flat, which meant it was just a small flat in New York City that only had cold water. George remembers this apartment and this neighborhood pretty well, even though he was so young. He remembers that it was on the fourth floor and there was no elevator. He, of course, remembers that there was no hot water running from the apartment, which, if you can think about it, being in New York City, in the winter and not having hot water, that would be a little brutal. A lot of these cold water flats would have some kind of a stove in them where people would heat up their water, but a lot of them also did not have that, and it really was just cold water that was available to them. But George and his mother were so grateful to have a place in New York City and to be able to live independently, and it was really important to George's mother. This meant that she had a home for her husband once the war was over, a place that he could come back to that was theirs and theirs alone. One thing that George really remembers about living in this apartment is the park that was nearby. I remember the playground. My mom would take me to the playground every day. You can tell that even though he was so young and this was a short period of his life, that little thing that his mother would do every single day, taking him to the park, really made a difference in George's life and in his childhood memories. When George turned four years old, his father finally came home from war. After his father arrived back in New York, he started up a residency in pathology. He distinctly remembers his dad taking him on nature walks. They would collect bugs, insects. His father would teach him about the different types of bugs. George's father also would bring him into his office every now Again. My father was a pathologist. I saw my first autopsy before I was 10. He used the exact same methodology to look at guitars. His most vivid memory of his father's office, though, funny enough, was not medical related, but was about a device called the dictaphone. <laughs> it wasn't tape, 
They made records. They were floppy records. This is for green. The next residence that George would live in would be in the Bronx. This was definitely a step up from his four-story walk-up cold water flat. This was actually a duplex. His landlord lived on the first floor and his family lived on the second floor. George remembers that his landlord had a big backyard that George could see from his window, but he was not allowed to go in the yard because that was the landlord's property. So he remembers looking out the window, wanting to play in that yard, and not being able to. Instead, George found a couple of lots of vacant land very close to his duplex. He would walk to those vacant lots on almost a daily basis and go searching for bugs and insects. Nearby to one of these lots was a man who had a pigeon house. He was always feeding the pigeons and attracting pigeons and of course when you attract pigeons it also attracts a lot of rats. George remembers going over to the vacant lots at night and watching the rats. The rats were fun to watch. After moving to the Bronx, George found himself in the midst of a neighborhood group, shall I say. There were three other little boys around the same age as George that George had sometimes forced interactions with and other times voluntary interactions with. First, there was Doug. Doug was your typical bully and was mean to George every time he saw him. Not only was he mean to him, but he would literally beat him up. Eventually, George really had no choice but to avoid Doug altogether. Second was a boy everyone called Junior. Junior was nice. He wasn't mean like Doug and he never wanted to beat up George or do anything to harm George, but Junior simply had his own interests. Junior, for example, loved to play dress up. But although Junior was nice and George appreciated that about Junior, he just never was really interested in playing with Junior because Junior always wanted to play dress up and that just was a game that George didn't want to play. Then there was a boy named Philip. Philip was probably George's best friend. Philip and George got along really well and had the same interests. They they wanted to play the same games, they both hated Doug, and Philip was overall a lot like George. However, all of this was in the early 1950s, which was before the polio vaccine. Sadly, about a year or two into their friendship, Philip died of polio, and it would have been around 1951 when George was about five or six years old. The only friend I really had. George was about six years old. He was finally ready to go to kindergarten, which was a big deal for him. As a toddler, he really hadn't been socialized with other kids. His mother took him to the park every day to play, but there weren't a lot of children there. So going to kindergarten was kind of a shock to his system. I wasn't very socialized. I bit two kids, and I hit under the teacher's desk. I kind of made a joke when he said this and I said maybe the kids deserved it and he kind of laughed and he said I don't know that they did. <laughs> I think they just kind of like got in my personal space. <laughs> Going to kindergarten can be very traumatic. I mean for any child but especially if you haven't been playing with other kids up until that point and if you've been with your mother every single day all day it's very very difficult to be pulled away from that kind of a bond. The only good thing that George remembers about the kindergarten and about the school was that there was another vacant part of land right next to the school more like a park. At the age of eight his family moved yet again, this time to the village of Tuckahoe. I hope I'm saying that right. Tuckahoe might have been one of George's favorite places to live simply because there were two lakes within walking distance to his house. Not only were there two lakes, but there were also several nature trails. George's mother would not let George have dogs or cats, but if the animal or insect or reptile could live in a cage, then George was allowed to have it. George took full advantage of this and was always bringing home insects and frogs. And one day, he found his first snake. He brought it all the way home, took it out into the front yard. He was going to lay it out on the lawn, get a really good look at it. And when he did that, the snake just within two seconds buried itself into the dirt of the lawn and was gone. <laughs> and George remembers being very disappointed that the snake instantly had crawled into the dirt. But he says since that day, he knew where he could go to get snakes. When George was in the third grade, his family moved yet again. This time to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. George remembers really struggling with this move because all of the children had already learned their multiplication tables. At the time that George was moving, he was just beginning to learn multiplication tables and felt like he was really lagging behind, which he was. He was lagging behind. He kind of jokes that he doesn't even use multiplication tables to this day. He just uses a calculator. <laughs> but do not be fooled about George's ability to maintain information. One of the most fascinating traits of George Grun is his ability to memorize every single model, make, detail, and story behind all of these different types of guitars. Many people even say that they believe George has a photographic memory. I questioned him if he had a photographic memory, and he kind of laughed and said, I don't have a photographic memory, you know, not, not by any means. He says he simply memorizes things by memorizing patterns. George's family eventually moved to Illinois, and George attended the 
the Oak Park and River Forest High School. He went on to study ethology at the University of Chicago, which means the science of animal behavior. While he was in college, George's brother started to develop a fascination for a guitar. George remembers going to help his brother shop for a better guitar. He started to realize older guitars sounded better than newer guitars. He started to recognize how old guitars fit together and the different parts that were associated with them. And if you remember, George saw his first autopsy before he was 10. It's kind of a gruesome way to put it, but there's kind of a parallel between autopsies and the medical side of things and the construction of guitars. My father was a pathologist. I saw my first autopsy before I was 10. He used the exact same methodology to look at guitars. One of the main concepts that you learn about in ethology studies is zoological taxonomy, or the classifying of animals and species into categories based on certain characteristics. George describes his purpose with vintage guitars as a kind of taxonomy. Do you always skip a stair? <laughs> That's fast. <laughs> She lost the kid to the lions. Yes, she did. I would not be happy having only one. You know, I have one wife, but with guitars, I prefer a harem. And a harem is okay because they don't fight with each other, they get along very well together. There's no legal, ethical, moral problems with having more than one guitar at a time. And I like it that way. I also have multiple pets, as you have noticed. People ask me what's my favorite snake. Well, well if I only needed a lot of one, I wouldn't have 24 snakes in the office. So, I have my entourage here. I like it that way. It works for me. George moved to Tennessee and attended one semester at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. While he was studying this one semester at the University of Tennessee, George started to sell guitars. He started to go purchase old guitars and different parts and put them together, develop these instruments that just sounded really, really good. And one day, George received a phone call from Hank Williams Jr. Somebody who was close to Hank Williams Jr. knew that George had a really nice guitar for sale. He told him, hey, you should go check out this guy's guitar. So Hank Williams Jr. calls George Brune and goes and purchases this guitar from him. Tells him, you should really start a store in Nashville, Tennessee. You would do fabulously. He really inspired George to start this store. After one semester at the University of Tennessee, George decided to end his studies there and pursue this new career 
easier option of selling vintage guitars in Nashville. Hank Jr. promised George that if he came to Nashville, he would have an apartment waiting for him and that he would help him start a music store. George packed up all of his things from the University of Tennessee, moved from Knoxville to Nashville in 1968. When he got to Nashville, sure enough, Hank had lined up an apartment for him at the corner of 17th and Edge Hill. But instead of starting a music store right away, Hank advised him to just kind of get settled into the network in Nashville and really develop some roots and some connections first before putting all of his money into a brick and mortar. George really valued Hank's advice. And even though he didn't actually help him make a music store, he did help him make all of the connections that would eventually get him there. For the first 12 months being in Nashville, George just started meeting people, connecting with people, getting his name out there that he was somebody who had vintage guitars. He started placing ads in the local newspaper for wheelers and dealers that were interested in vintage guitars, mandolins, and banjos. At first, these ads didn't result in a lot of sales, but they did result in a lot of connections. Everybody in town who was in that network started calling George to get an idea of who he was and what he was selling. Soon enough, George started selling several instruments a week, which was a lot more than what he described in Knoxville, Tennessee as being possibly one instrument sale per month. In addition to placing these ads, George was also frequently attending music festivals and would deal various vintage guitars at various music festivals. At one of these music festivals, he met a man named Randy Wood. Now, Randy lived in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, which is about two hours from Nashville. If you haven't seen my video about Muscle Shoals, by the way, I will link it down below. Randy was working with a guy pretty closely named Tut Taylor. Now, Tut Taylor was pursuing his own music career, but he also had a passion for woodworking. He was actually working in a sign business, painting signs, but he also also had a woodworking shop and he and Randy would often work in the woodworking shop building necks for banjos or carving out pieces for various instruments. They would do other sorts of vintage instrument repair work. One day Tut received a call from Gibson Guitar. Gibson was offering him an opportunity to assist them in carving out new pieces of wood for a new line of banjos that they wanted to release. Tut knew that he couldn't do this alone so he called Randy and George Groon and asked them what they thought about joining him in this venture with Gibson. The three of them agreed that an opportunity with Gibson was something they probably shouldn't turn down. The three of them got together and drove from Nashville to Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is an eight hour drive just to meet with the president of Gibson Guitars. It's kind of funny because George remembers them just being appalled and amazed at the general lack of knowledge that Gibson had about their own historic instruments. But even though they were kind of thinking these people don't know as much as we thought they did, they thought, you know what? This is an opportunity we just can't turn down. It's Gibson. Tut eventually moved his entire family from Georgia to Nashville. Randy moved from Muscle Shoals, Alabama to Nashville, Tennessee to start this venture with George Groon in Music City. Once the three of them were in Nashville, Tennessee, the next thing that they had to do was find a location for their shop. Now, George had already been in Nashville for over a year at this point. He already knew the scene, knew the network. He knew that Lower Broadway was the place to be, the Ryman Auditorium and Tootsie's. The back door to the Ryman Auditorium actually faced the back door to Tootsie's. Tootsie's is still there today. Tootsie's is a very popular bar restaurant where a lot of musicians are known to have started their career. The Ryman did not have a lot of backstage room for the performers to hang out at in between shows. So when the Ryman was having a show, the performers would be hanging out backstage in the alley behind the Ryman Auditorium, which was Tootsie's. A lot of the performers would go to Tootsie's and play there after the show or even before their show or in between shows. All of the country music fans who were at Tootsie's got to enjoy the presence and possibility a show of their favorite country music star. Around this time too is when the Johnny Cash show was happening at the Ryman Auditorium. That show specifically drew tons and tons of talent. And at this time that George was in Nashville, he actually knew somebody else from a music festival who knew someone else who was playing in the Johnny Cash show. And that person was named Norman Blake. Norman Blake calls George Groon and tells him that he's coming to Nashville. They all got together and hung out. George and Norman instantly hit it off as really good friends. Norman actually started inviting George Groon backstage to the Johnny Cash show. George remembers that is probably the most exciting part of his years in Nashville, being able to be backstage at the Johnny Cash show and meet all of the top names in music. So when Tut and Randy and George are now in Nashville looking for a brick and mortar place, George says to Tut and Randy, I think we've got to be on Lower Broadway, specifically 4th Avenue, you know, right where all of this action is happening. They actually put a deposit in for a really rundown restaurant right on 4th Avenue, but unfortunately that was a little bit sketchy because the person they paid the deposit to turns out didn't own 
the place and also didn't have a long-term lease there. Just kind of sketchy circumstances. Um, unfortunately, they did not get that deposit back, but there was another location right next door that they could put a legit deposit on and get within the same year. In January of 1970, they finally purchased their space at 111 4th Avenue North, right by that backstage back door and kind of hangout area between the Ryman and Tootsies. It measured about 20 feet by 40 feet in total. And it was extremely run down. Tut and Randy immediately began building walls in the space to separate the areas into a storefront, a little office, and a repair shop. They decided to create a business called GTR Incorporated, which stood for George, Tut, and Randy, but was also a fun little acronym for guitar. And as soon as they were all set up, Gibson sent them down some carving machines that would help them carve these pieces for Gibson's new banjo line. Now, pretty quickly into working for Gibson, they realized parts of this contract didn't make a lot of sense for their business. Gibson was only paying them $60 for their carving skills, and the instruments were being sold for about $2,000. After a few months of carving for Gibson at a very low price, they decided to kind of pivot their business model and began making primary profits by selling and repairing vintage guitars. Now, Tut and George were the two partners of the business, and Randy was technically an employee who was receiving a regular paycheck. Tut had a family to feed and was pursuing his own music career in addition to working in the partnership. Now, while they all kind of found their rhythm in this new business venture, that's not to say that they were making a lot of money. They do remember, even though times were kind of tough, all of the fun that happened with the Johnny Cash show and all of the backstage interactions that they got to be a part of being so close to the action in their store. There was actually one incident that George remembers vividly. He put a mandolin on his storefront window. He believed this mandolin was handmade by Gibson circa 1900. He later realized it was a Gibson model that was 1905, but it was still a very early, very rare model. It's pretty close either way. He, he says, oh, I was Technically, I was wrong, but what he thought it was was actually pretty close to what it is. 1905 versus 1900 is only a five-year difference, for example. He put the mandolin on the storefront window, and he put a sign next to it saying, Handmade Gibson Mandolin 1900, meaning circa 1900. The year was 1900. He remembers sitting there with Tut and with Randy when an elderly couple walks by the window. The wife says to the husband, Look, honey, a fiddle. And the husband says, Oh, wow, well, yeah, how much is it? The wife looked at the sign and said, Well, the sign says 19 dollars. The husband said, $19, that's too much. Let's, let's go. And they walked away. It could be funny, but when this is your store and these vintage instruments are so rare and spectacular, to have somebody say something like that and then just walk away kind of makes you think, do people really appreciate this? <laughs> it's unfortunate for an instrument of that kind to have had that kind of a conversation said about it. Luckily, George says most people who came into the store did not recognize that as a $19 fiddle. It still was just an unfortunate conversation for the three of them to overhear, especially when they've had a few days where they haven't made that much money. And this mandolin, by the way, ended up in Roy Acuff's personal collection. It was a remarkable, remarkable instrument. And not soon after that incident, it was a September day, when George came to open the store and there was a note from Tut on the door that said he believed it was time for him to move on and he was willing to sell his share of the business back to George. Tut had a family. He had to take care of that family. Tut also had a music career. He wanted to pursue his music career. George wasn't ecstatic. Tut wanted this, but he respected that, and Tut was gone from GTR Incorporated by the end of September. Randy Wood ended up staying with George for a while after Tut had left, but eventually Randy also parted ways with George. George kept the name GTR Incorporated for a few years, even though the T and the R were gone. It was not until 1976 George decided to find a new location for the store and to rename it Groon Guitars. His new location was not very far from the original location. His new location was at 410 Broadway, and that's where he would continue to deal vintage guitars until 1993. 410 Broadway was also still very close to the Ryman Auditorium, and actually one day Eric Clapton was playing at the Ryman Auditorium and just walked right on across the street over to Groom Guitars, and that's where Eric Clapton bought the guitar Blackie. Eric Clapton is not the only well-known person to purchase from George. He's notorious for selling to the best of the best. Green Guitars is now in its 53rd year of business and is located at its largest location to date. You can currently visit George at Green Guitars at 2120 8th Avenue South in Nashville, Tennessee, which is just a short drive from its original location. George relates many aspects of guitars and models and serial numbers to ethology and to animal behavior, and he also 
sees a lot of parallels between building his business and the ethological studies that he pursued for so many years. He says that what is so important at Groom Guitars is how the body is operating. He says, first of all, it has never been a one-man operation. It started off with him, Tut, and Randy, and today they have a staff of over 18 people and eight repairmen. Hi. Hi. I've known George since probably about 2000. I met him when I was 16 years old, though. I sold a guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Back when he was downtown on Broadway, I had a guitar I wasn't using. I wanted to get rid of it and he was the guy to go to back in whatever that was 1986 or something and um, I sold him a 72 Fender Mustang so I know I was mad at him too because he didn't give as much money as I was wanting for him but hey he's a businessman he did what worked for the business so but anyway that sucked I've known him distantly for a long time and George had been after me for a little while but come work for him because he wanted somebody to manage his repair shop and since I was investment running business it wasn't too big of a transition, you know, so uh, I started in 2006, April, and I've been here ever since. Oh, I just think he's a brilliant man, you know. I mean, his knowledge depth is profound, unlike anybody you'll ever meet. And, you know, he's just an incredibly enjoyable person to have a conversation with pretty much about any topic. My passion as far as working here was in the repair shop. That's where I started. Was I took over management of that shop and I made it into a profitable operation. Instrument repair is kind of the backbone of, of what Grim Guitars is all about because we can't sell wartime guitars that are not in proper spec and there aren't very many people that can be skilled to be able to do the type of repair work that they do here. So the entire third floor of the building is all repair and it's dedicated to, to being the backbone of the business. I knew that's always been the a really critical part of this because there are music stores, you know, that buy and sell instruments all over the place, but to have the qualification to do the repair work and restoration work, um, you're not going to find that too many places outside of here. So that's been the backbone of business, like I said, for a really long time and continues to be. George also believes that what differentiates his music store from other music stores is the proportion of the body as well. Money alone doesn't make the business successful. Mm -hmm. If you have money alone, you can start with this large fortune and end up with a smaller fortune. If you don't run business well, it doesn't make money. It helps to have seed money to start, but the standard thoughts are how you know, most businesses fail in the first two or three years because they're undercapitalized. It's not true. We've got, you know, we're well both started one fertilized cell it's programmed a bit differently so that the blue whale gets bigger. But if you design a business like a political cartoon where the head's bigger than the body and there's no internal organ systems, it won't work. Yeah. And that's the reason most businesses fail. They're not designed like a real live organism. Here we have organ systems. They have to be functional. They have to be in the right proportion to the size of the business and to each other. There have to be flow patterns. And even jobs that are not very glamorous, like a janitor. Mm -hmm. Without it, everything gets cluttered and it's like having kidney failure. You uh, need to have all the organ systems in place. For example, his showroom has never been more than one third of the store. His repair shop has always been, if not the same size as the showroom, slightly bigger. One of George's favorite things is to build relationships with his clients and his fans who walk through the door. He says every day is like living in a reality show, except it's not scripted. He says my reality show is reality. You never know what's going to happen. You never know who is going to walk through those doors at Green Guitars and what they're going to be bringing with them. On one of the days that I was with George, George Bowen walked in with a beautiful handmade guitar for Arlen Roth. Ooh, baby, that was a good one. And it doesn't stop there. Vince Gill has been known to frequent groom guitars. Eric Clapton has frequented groom guitars. People come from all over the country to bring their guitars to George or to purchase a guitar from George or simply to come play some of the guitars. And George's inventory has been played by the best of the best. But if you thought that guitars, mandolins, banjos, and snakes were where it stopped with George and his life passions, you would be wrong. After spending a few hours with George, he looked at me and said he needed to run an errand, which is when he took me across the street to a very cute antique store, and I learned about George's fascination for antiques. I 
I am not a raincoat here to keep you warm Then go back in the closet after the storm I'm not a match simply waiting to burn All I am is a friend, your friend to the end To criticize the risk All I am is a friend Your friend till the end All I am is a friend Your friend till the end his office you can see that there are tons of antiques just walking into his space is like walking into a museum he is no stranger to antique stores in fact as soon as we walked through the door they knew exactly who he was and said hey there George how can we help you <laughs> George also has a loving wife it is his main life passion to be a husband to her and a family man George is actually my stepfather mm -hmm. and he and my mother have known each other for 30 years and he was being actually as of yesterday they've been married for 20 years now. In fact, we were eating lunch when George received a phone call from his wife worried about a wasp nest that she had found outside their window. Within seconds, George transformed from an antique loving guitar professional snake lover to a wasp expert. Hello Barbara. <laughs> yeah, they look... Oh, they're hornets. Yeah, no, well, they're not, well, hornets are a type of wasp, they're, they're order hymenoptera, and uh, ants, and uh, bees, and wasps, and hornets are all uh, different, uh, different genera, but uh, they are order hymenoptera, and those are hornets. I'm not sure exactly which species, of course, but they're on the outside, we're on the inside, we don't open that window. You know, we have a bird feeder, and we watch those, and uh, these are right by the window, and you can watch those. It's very educational. Murder hornets are like, you get over two inches long, and they kill bees. He calmly asked several questions, including how many inches the bodies were of the wasps, so that he could properly identify what type of a wasp it was. So next time you are driving down 8th Avenue in Nashville and you see broom guitars, don't be fooled. This is not your average music store. This is half a century of knowledge, integrity, and perseverance. And anybody who's anybody knows who George Green is. Waiting to burn. All I am is a friend, your friend to the end. The people, those guys who are out there right now, they ask me my favorite guitar. Well, it's hard to even define what is a guitar. I've been at it a while. You'd think I could maybe define what is a guitar. If you were to ask 20 people who have the ability to draw a picture of a violin, gave them an hour to do it, and they didn't see what each other were doing, they'd all come up with something that looks like a fiddle. If you ask 20 people, draw me a picture of a guitar. The guitars don't all look alike at all. It can be an electric guitar. It can be an acoustic guitar. It can be solid body with no sound chamber. It can be a hollow body guitar with a vibrating sound board. They're not defined by their body size or shape. They're not really even defined by how they produce sound because the electric guitar producing sound with the pickups and an amplifier does not have the solid body, don't have a vibrating top or sound chamber at all. There's a lot of different kinds of music played on guitar. It can be anything from rock and roll to heavy metal to classical or flamenco or dainty finger picking on steel strings or flat picking, bluegrass. Yeah, it, I can't define what is a guitar by shape, by size. I can't even define what it is by tuning because standard tuning is one of many tunings that work on guitar. A lot of the blues players never in their life have played a tune in what we call standard tuning, wouldn't know how to play in it, never tried. 
that we don't define a guitar even by whether it has frets. Because a lap steel or a dobro doesn't have to have frets to be played with a steel bar. A tenor guitar might have four strings. A regular, most regular guitars have six, but 12 string guitars have six pairs of strings. And then there's some people who play seven string guitar that has an extra bass string. And that is a Yepis classical player who's playing on a 10 string guitar. It's such that about all I can say is it's a stringed instrument that can be used to play chords as well as melody lines on single strings. But that doesn't even cover it well enough because a loop would fit that definition. So and somehow I know it I know when I see it that it's a guitar. On the other hand, actually when you see a pedal steel, it's a rectangular body doesn't have any neck, it doesn't have any sound chamber, and it's strictly electric and it's played with a bar. I have difficulty recognizing it as a guitar, although I know it evolved from a guitar. But the earliest Hawaiian guitars were just a regular type acoustic guitar with a high nut and saddle and steel strings and played with a steel bar. But then that evolved into lap steels with solid body and tuned. Same had six string neck, but then they soon had seven string and eight string neck Hawaiian steels, lap steels. Then they came out with pedal steels later, and the pedal steels typically don't look anything like what we think of as a guitar because there's a rectangular box that's strung up and can be played with a steel bar like a Hawaiian, but has more strings, some have 10 strings, a few have 12 strings, but they're not 12 string like a 12 string guitar, they're 12 individual tuned strings, whereas a 12 string standard acoustic guitar is six paired strings with octave tunings. But it's hard to define what is a guitar, and there's so many different kinds of music that can be played on guitar. I can't. I have a number of favorite guitars, but I also have over a hundred instruments in my collection. And I remember my first four guitars, and after that, I'm sort of at a loss. But uh, the first one was the Kanemata's Classical. I traded it in uh, about a 1915 Gibson L. It's actually the style O artist guitar with a curl and scroll looks almost going to be a mandolin. Maybe 1915. That was my second guitar. It's an unusual first and second guitar for people, but that's what I had. And then my third guitar is a 1937 Martin F7 Archtop, which is a very rare guitar. But I got it for 75 bucks back then, around 64. And my fourth guitar was a 1924 Gibson L5, which cost me, in 65, that cost me, it was for my big $400 for it, which was really tough to come by. $400 in 65 was real money. The dollar bought more back then. And it was more than 10 times what that would be now as a college student without a job. <coughs> Mom and Dad gave me money at the beginning of each month for off-campus apartment rent, food, books. I'd spend all of it on guitars, but I could find in my searches for the ones I really wanted for me I would uncover 15 or 20 instruments that were for sale at a ridiculous cheap price in the pawn shops on the south side of Chicago. They could buy some of them and resell them within a week and have all the money mommy and daddy gave me back. And I could still pay my bills, which is what got me started. And you had asked about my first guitar. You know, a lot of people may have fond memories of their first guitar. I really don't, because I discovered pretty quickly that it was the wrong guitar and didn't suit me. And the reality is that most people's first guitars are not 
by any means their best guitars and usually are things that for one reason or other they outgrow and I pretty promptly traded it off. So I had it for a few months but then I didn't want to keep it. I didn't have the budget at that time to just collect multiple guitars. Your impression of a city wish You loved more than everything you gave for it And I'm not here to criticize the risk All I am is a friend Your friend till the end All I am is a friend Your friend till the end Your friend to the end. 